So this is a uh, another approach that we discussed last time. Uh, it's from a recent publication uh, that talks about the proximal origin of SARS uh, coronavirus 2, um, published in March. Um, and what they did there is a very simple analysis, um, simple from the standpoint of just a few sequences. Um, so let's take a look at the few sequences that they used and what are some of the conclusions that they came to, which are um, described right here in the abstract. So um, here you can see that they used only one, two, three, four, five, six sequences. Those sequences, one came from humans, SARS -co uh, COVID uh, coronavirus 2. So that is that same sequence that we talked about right here. So it's this MN908947. Um, and then they took a few other. So for example, one of the previous um, outbreaks was SARS, uh, not SARS-2, this one, but the previous SARS, which had, um, I believe, a higher mortality rate, but it was not as infectious, also originated from China. Um, so they have another human sample and then three other bat samples. One of them is bat rat G13, which is a very recent sample, which, was, uh, which is one of the closest ones to this human one. And then they have another one of the pangolin, which is a Chinese or a Malaysian uh, animal uh, that we uh, think it might be the intermediate host. Right, so by comparing these sequences, um, here what you see is just uh, the spike glycoprotein. Uh, and so what we're focused on here is the receptor binding domain and then a polybasic cleavage, which we'll look at today later on. Uh, but the, the first thing that they did is they asked the question, well, if we just take these six sequences, which one is the most close, which one is then the, you know, less close, less, less, and less. So they are in that order right here. So the closest one is this one, the bat, bat G13. The next closest one is the pangolin, a human, and then two other bat SARS, right? So we know that the human SARS coronavirus 2 from all the other human coronaviruses that we have seen before is the closest to this human SARS. But from other animals, which is closer, right, by sequence similarity, it are these bat and pangolin. And so what does that tell us? That tells us that naturally you would think that if a virus is already ha already present in the human population, that variation of the same virus, you know, that's a fairly natural thing to happen, right? If we've seen it before, let's say we see flu, and then we see flu recur in humans, but a little bit different. So if we see that similarity to other humans, we know that it came from other humans, and that's natural. But if we see it, that another host has a Say, oh, okay, well, maybe that host might be the actual original, right, uh, where that came from. So that, that's the basic idea. Of course, there's a little more detail to it, and we'll look at that uh, more today. But first, let's deal with it. So last time we talked about how do we actually measure the similarity. We measure the similarity at the basic level when we have nucleotide sequences. Those nucleotide sequences contain letters, A, T, C, and G. And those letters, the combinations of those letters can change between one genome and another. And they can change in several different ways. We will see substitutions and insertions, and we'll see deletions. And so when we see, when we will start looking at the sequences today, we'll see that those deletions actually are very important and you can see them as deletions that have happened if one originated from a more full genome and there has been a section deleted or the other way around that maybe one or two or three letters were added in the new genome and then the substitutions have also different significance to them so what might be the different significance to them well some Mutations are called what's called synonymous, and some are called non-synonymous. Synonymous means that even though the nucleotide changes, 
the amino acid that the that is produced by that codon does not change right so synonymous like two synonymous words synonyms they essentially mean the same thing right the letters might be different but the meaning is the same so the same here right so that language nucleotide language that has to produce uh, words or proteins in the um, sequence language produces something very similar or produces something very different so synonymous means the same amino acid was produced non-synonymous means that the amino acid changed and so those are of course the more important changes that we should consider so when we have those changes one the non-synonymous mutations are more significant than synonymous but then also the different change which uh, amino acid change to which amino acid also has a uh, significance as well and that significance is going to be important because of these chemical properties of amino acids that have a role in how the protein functions right and so we talked about that as well so they have different chemical um, properties these amino acids um, and we'll see the significance of those right and we'll see how the sequence is actually a beautiful language that allows the virus which is a very small organism compared to other organisms to um, make very smart devices functional devices that we call proteins and so these amino acids as you can see right here some are polar changed some are uh, polar charged sorry some are polar uncharged and some are nonpolar. so nonpolar are basically your building blocks right so if you think of bricks you got to build a wall you use these non-polar uh, non-polar bricks right so you got to fill out some space you got to support the building that's what you use then the other two kinds the polar charged and the polar uncharged now they have different functionality right if you have a door in the house or if you have um you know uh something else right so it, something that attaches to something else or something that has to go through something else right those two have different properties so if something has to move freely through water um it has to have less friction and less ability to connect and it has to just flow and and not um, get stuck anywhere if something needs to get stuck somewhere and connect to something right it has to have other properties so that's why these different amino acids are actually very important their properties are very important so the change in the nucleotide sequence that makes a change in the amino acid change change is important and what type of change for example if it went from polar to uh, polar charge to polar uncharged right that's a bigger change than for example from one polar charge to another polar charge etc so how can we study these relationships what we talked about last time is that we have this concept of phylogenetic relationship and the phylogenetic relationship seeks to explain by use of a mathematical model for example uh, a Bayesian mo model uh, which is a probabilistic model it seeks to explain the time difference and this process of specific for example mutations right the likelihood of those mutations happening at a natural steady pace this tree describes that process by connecting sequences so here at the end we have present day species so these would be our studied um samples that we will take today and then we want to connect them to a potential origin right so this right here might be an origin we might not know what that origin is it might not necessarily have a specific sequence to it but we have typically a relationship between these by saying they came from the same origin and if they came from the same origin did they come directly from the same origin like here or did they come many steps through several intermediate um, hosts right and so the idea here is that if a virus goes directly from a bat to a human it has to have specific adaptations happen those adaptations cannot happen out in the air out in the air the virus does not do anything it doesn't replicate it doesn't you know uh, change it doesn't mutate it only changes and mutates within a host so when we talk about something coming from something, 
we know that if a lot of mutations have accumulated and those mutations had to have accumulate within one or two different hosts, that's how we can connect what we observe today with those rates of mutation that we know happen, for example, at the level of um, RNA or DNA or whatever sequence we are dealing with. So that's the concept of phylogenetic trees. Now, there are many different ways of building these phylogenetic trees, um, many different methods, just like there are many different methods that are good for different types of sequences. Multiple sequence alignment is something that you know, people have been working on for a long time, so a lot of different methods have evolved. And phylogenetic trees also were first, the idea of phylogeny of this evolutionary relationship was introduced right around Darwin's time. And so since then, people have been trying to organize taxonomic relationships to say something came from something, and now this is what we observe today. What that means is that we essentially are trying to put our logic, human logic, right, of organizing sequences or organizing species that we know of into some kind of groups, into some kinds of relationships. And we want to see how our logic of learning and understanding these sequences is reflected on the actual data that we can collect. Now, the visualization of these trees can look circular or radial in different ways. And they essentially all have the same elements. So you can see that they all have branches, nodes, clades. Clades are these groups. And so what we are doing is we are just visualizing it in different ways. And we can sometimes try to incorporate time, which isn't always available by the time. But sometimes we can just for you know, representation purposes, visualization purposes, simplify something to look like this. Or if we want to incorporate a lot of time scale into the data, we will have to um, some. OK. Just one second. Okay, sorry about that. Um, okay, so any questions up until now? Okay, if you have any questions, you can post them right here in the chat and I will see them. And if you have any questions or if everything is okay, okay. Okay, so the first um, thing that I do want to mention is that these um, sequences, of course, do not come to us in an assembled format, right? We do not have a full sequence just coming out of a sample that we collect. And therefore, we have to, first of all, assemble these genomes together. So the way that this would typically be done, and, and here, for example, we can um, start thinking of these approaches. We have a project example that's not uh, from COVID-19, but from a different virus, um, that you can see how a presence of a virus, right? So if you imagine a human uh, sample, for example, RNA-seq, shows us expression of different sequences in uh, the human tissue, right? So, or some tissue. So whenever we take that tissue, we assume that most of the genes that are being expressed are linked to a human gene. So if they're linked to a human gene, we can map that sequence onto a human gene sequence and find that there's a fairly good match, right? Assuming that there's some changes, assuming that there's some mutations, et cetera. But nevertheless, there will be a pretty good match. Sometimes we will take a sample, for example, uh, a fecal sample, or a lung, uh, for example, saliva, or you know, some, something from the lungs, and we will see that there are reads that do not match the host genome. None of the genes in the host genome have any sequences that are anywhere close to what we are seeing. So that is where, and, and this is a project that speaks exactly about that, this is where 
uh, you can see what they did was they took samples from patient, um, this from the lung fluid, um, uh, from the supernatant virus cultures. And so they were used, uh, they used RNA extraction, next generation sequencing. Um, and then they did metagenomic analysis by mapping these reads that they got, right? So what you can do is you can amplify anything that looks like a viral sequence from the host samples. And then you can map those reads onto a database of all of the known viruses or of viruses that you suspect to be there. So that's essentially what they did. They took um, those samples from bats, they amplified them, and then they started mapping. And you can see right here, some of the genomes that they mapped it on uh, and uh, compared with different, uh, so you can see that the quality of mapping is represented by this line right here. So some of the mapping was fairly bad, right? In fact, the majority of these were pretty bad. Some were pretty close, that this bat coronavirus ZC45, that's this pink line. And then they essentially produced a new sequence, which is this, um, rat g13 right that's where we get this genome rat g13 is they produced a new sequence with consensus from the reads that they got and developed a new genome that actually uh, produced a uh, very good high quality right and so another thing that we will talk about in future sessions if uh, we arrange those is that the consensus, the genome that we take and produce a FASTA file from a collection of samples or from one sample, typically does not reflect the complexity of viral populations um, within a single sample or within multiple samples. And there have been reports already about viral quasi-species in small numbers of patients uh, in China, where um, instead of looking at FASTA files at assembled genomes, uh, researchers were looking at actual reads from uh, patient samples and mapping all of those reads together to identify whether there are some highly conserved groups of sequences. And those are called viral quasi-species, which is um, occurring a lot of time with different RNA and DNA viruses. With RNA viruses, they're much more diverse. And so the dynamics of those populations also plays a role in uh, the process of infection and the process of replication because essentially multiple variations of the genome put a lot more strain on the immune system to be able to address those changes at the same time from the standpoint of the, um, you know, suppressing that uh, replication process. Okay, so last time I already introduced you to um, the NCBI virus database. So let's do this together now. We'll go to hands-on. So before we move on to this part, let me just make sure that everyone has their account and knows how to log in. So the way that we want to log in um, and do this next part is by going to server t bioinfo so this is the link. Okay. And please let me know once everybody is on this uh, URL. So if everybody is here, you should have gotten an email with your password. So if you see right here, um, I'm logged in. So you, you would see your account um, with your email address. And then remember that password is different from your educational login. That's done for security purposes. If you would like to change it and make it the same, go back to the educational site and change it. But we, um, we don't send out the same password by email for both of the um, platforms. 
Okay, so here, what we will do today, there's actually two sections that are um, using this phylogenetic analysis. And we will actually um, use this section right here called virus quasi-species. So if you're logged in already, um, you should be able to click on this arrow right next to virus quasi-species and go to demo virus MSA and phylogeny. And so by doing this, we'll first understand the process and some of the options that we have without first uploading any data. And then we'll kind of find the data and do this together. Okay, so here, let's just kind of look at an overview of what we have. So we have two big sections, beneficial detrimental mutations and deletions, and then virus quasi-species and their phylogeny. What we are seeing is a section that has to do with uh, identification of point mutations and then building uh, consensus, conserved genomes within a FASTQ file, right? So if you have some FASTQ files from patients, and I'll, you know, I can show you where you can find those, you'll be able to use this section in red. If you have only assembled genomes, FASTA files, you'll be able to use this and in blue. So what do we have here? We have to first load our data by pressing on start. So here you can see um, kind of what we are trying to do, right? We're trying to build a phylogenetic tree, for example, by analyzing mutations. The next thing that we have available after start is multiple sequence alignment because these are FASTA files, right? So we can't do anything with reads. We don't have reads. We don't have to map those reads. They're already assembled. We have to do multiple sequence alignment. So multiple sequence alignment is basically the process of comparing sequences, but not just comparing them. Here's my first sequence that started on this letter, the sequence on that letter, right? If one letter change happens, everything is gonna be different. So we have to first optimize it, right? And not just between a pair, between multiple samples that we have, so it's a fairly complex process to figure out how exactly is the best way to align them. But you know, here what we can see is the alignment, multiple sequence alignment. And then we have to convert the multiple sequence alignment from the nucleotide level to amino acid level, right? And so amino acids, as we talked about, have different properties and changes from one property to the other have greater significance than changes within the same chemical group. And then we have to also select the codons, right? So we're looking at the changes from amino acids, we're looking at the changes in terms of their codon position. And then after that, we can either select one of these trees, which we'll be able to do once we do the analysis of our own, or we can just select all of the phylogeny methods and all of the phylogeny methods will basically include all of these. Now, there, as I said, there are many different ways to do phylogenetic analysis. They were designed for different purposes. BEAST here uses a Bayesian uh, analysis or a model uh, that represents um, evolutionary processes. So we will take a look at some of those, and there's at least three that we would want to look at. And then this process will actually build the phylogenetic tree and analyze all of the trees and find the best tree because you'll see that each one of these methods will actually produce you know, multiple trees, 10, 11 trees. So we'll take a look at that too. Okay, and so then when you click OK, that will be the end. So here you click on end. And you'll see this because we are going to replicate this analysis ourselves. So we actually didn't add here the output files. However, I did send you by email. And Sona, let me know if you got those, uh, the files. Yeah. Did I, you get uh, those files? Yeah, I sent it to them actually. Okay, so with those files, yeah, so please check your email if you got those files. If you have those, 
you can use those. But before we go to use those, let's go to the virus database and find maybe samples that you would like to analyze. Okay, so um, let me know if you have those sequences, maybe put it in chat that you do have them. Okay, great. Okay, so if we go to NCBI virus, which is this link right here, Okay, so this link Okay. On this link, if you go there or you can just search on Google NCBI virus, this is an easy to use collection of different files and it's easy to prepare from here uh, the FASTA files that we will be using in our analysis. So you can see here search by virus. So we'll click here and here we can start writing Corona. Give it a moment and you see that it will pop up. Okay. And here, if you scroll down, you can see the different types of coronaviruses. We already talked about these. Okay. So we're going to be taking this beta coronavirus one. And what you'll be able to see is that there's about 3,000 different sequences, right? So each one of these is a full or some kind of an assembled sequence. And here you can see the different lengths, right? So we saw in our genome, it's about 30,000, 29,900 and something. Here you can see some longer, some shorter. So there is already a variation, right? So when we talk about 29,900 versus 31,190, that's about 1,000 nucleotides difference. Right, so we're talking about a lot of insertion compared one to another, right? Or a lot of deletion, however you want to think about it. So we're not looking at sequences that are almost identical. They're quite different, right? And those big differences actually are quite easy to understand, right? So if we take all of these different viruses, let's quickly go look over here. We started looking at this last time. So this kind of just provides us with a good visual illustration of this um, relationship between these different um, viruses. So here you can see, if you go right here to data, there's two data sets here to compare, to kind of see how closely they are related. And right now we're looking at a comparison between 44 coronavirus genomes. Which coronaviruses are we looking at? We're looking at COVID-19 which is this one right here, SARS, beta coronaviruses, and MERS. And so next to each one, uh, there's actually going to be, um, you know, some detail about these um, genomes, these sequences. So as you look at these sequences, gray represents an identical sequence. So if, if the bin, these are bins of 500 uh, amino acids long. You can switch it to be 250 or sorry, um, nucleotides. And you can see how there is some variation, right? But what is the closest? So what is the closest? If we use COVID-19, the beta coronavirus 2, if we use that one as our reference, which group of genomes is the closest to this novel beta coronavirus? Who can answer this question? You can just type your answer in chat. Okay, well that's, okay, something is Chinese, sorry, I don't know. Okay, yeah, 78554, yeah, 78554. Okay, so yeah, this one, but which group? <laughs> okay, um, so, so which group, um, SARS? Okay, great. So what we see here is that SARS sequences, right? So let's take a look 
where are they different? So let's take one of the most different bins and let's take a look at what we can find here. So we have the reference and here we have AY278554. Here we have nucleotides, right? Here we have amino acids. Here we have the reference genome. And you can see that both of these have gaps, for example, right? That's because of multiple sequence alignments. So here in this bin, which is right here, right? So this bin has this sequence. This is the reference sequence. The red ones are the different amino acids. And here you can see the sequence at the nucleotide level. And by the way, you can scroll here to see the full bin. Okay, so that is how dissimilar these sequences are. But this gives us a lot of detail Right? So we can go in and see at each individual position how the difference is. But how do we visualize in general? So in general, one of the ways we can look at it is we can take a look at the colors. This is just giving us the change. But how do we even further kind of see the relationship between samples and group them and things like that? So we can take a look down here. You can see some are unexpectedly different. And here, for example, we have some very different ones, right? So why do we think these two are different? How do we know? We can take this sample, for example. Let's take it from here. Now let's go back into our NCBI virus. Well, actually, instead of NCBI virus, let's just search for it. Okay, and we'll just read some of the metadata that we have available for this. So here you can see that this is Middle East. So this is MERS, respiratory syndrome, coronavirus isolate, right? And why do you think it's so different from the other ones? Why do you think when we see the sequence alignment, it looks so different? From either the reference genome or even from, as you can see, even within the group of MERS genomes, which are all the orange ones, why do you think it's so different, these two? partial genome. Great. Yeah, so exactly. So as you can see right here, it says it's a partial genome, right? So it's not even a full genome. And you can see how much is missing right here, 1 to 15,000. So about half of it is not even there. And so it's quite obvious that it's going to be very different. So how do we further summarize these relationships? For example, if we look at the phylogenetic tree, Right, we can see that beta coronaviruses group together, but they have some groups within as well. MERS also have some, and they also have some outliers. And then we have uh, the SARS group grouped together with this reference genome that we had. Okay, now let's switch really quickly and look at the COVID-19 human genomic sequences. Okay, this is the picture of human COVID-19 sequences. And you can see how it's very different from what we saw there, right? So the differences are actually much, much smaller. And so therefore the groups are also going to be much more difficult to understand. So now that we know this relationship between these different types of different or fairly similar genomes, Let's go ahead and find the genomes that we would like to use. So we already selected the virus, right? So again, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be doing something of my own. So I will show you how, you know, for example, a question that I might have is, okay, well, can I find bat uh, SARS 
um, genomes, so genomes that were isolated from bats. Can I find another host? Maybe, for example, a camel. MERS came from camel. Um, could I find a pangolin? Let's see what we have. And maybe a human, right? So let's just compare different hosts. And let's see what kinds of uh, genomes do we have. So how do we do that? So right here we have host. And here, let's start with human. So we have about 1,200 human ones. We can add another one. So let's add here bat. Okay, and here you have these different bats. Not too many. Do we have camel? We have a lot of a lot of Arteodactyla, which includes camels. Maybe we want to be more specific. Okay, so for you, you guys think of what samples you want to uh, compare. And as you think about it, okay, so actually this one has 23. So let's take this one. Um, human. And then once you're ready, once you found the sample groups that you want to do, tell me what you're going to be looking for right so just so that i have an idea of some of the um, data sets that you guys are thinking of okay or if you want to first kind of propose a comparison you can go ahead and do that okay so let's say humans and camels and bats okay let's look at sequence length or not sequence length, let's look at uh, nucleotide completeness. Select complete only. If we have incomplete, we'll have a lot of variation that doesn't come from real variation, real biological variation, it will come from technical variation. Okay, so now we have 150. Maybe we don't need all of them all of the human ones right so for example we can look at specific dates and okay 109 what geographic locations let's just limit it to north america And let's just check what we have here. So I see a lot of human. Okay, so only human from, uh, if we select North America, let's also select Asia. What do we get there? So again, a lot of human samples. If I want to summarize this data, right? So if I want to understand what do I have in total? So here you can see, for example, all the camel ones are from African samples. How do I get, okay, so here I have nine different genomes, okay? So this is a pretty good comparison, it seems to me, but it's a little bit hard for me to understand what do I have. So I have here um, Africa, Asia, North America, okay? Where did all the, um, human ones go. Start again. Okay, so what do I have here? Camel, human, 
Okay, so not a lot of options actually, right? But I have some 13 genomes right here that I can select from. So if I select all of them and click right here on download, I can download different options. For example, what's useful to download is just this table so that later on when I get my phylogenetic tree or I get my sequence alignment, I can remember what were the actually the samples, all the metadata that I had for my samples, right? So I have location, hosts, and all of that kind of information. So I can download the CSV format and that will give me that table. If I want to compare nucleotide sequences, I would select here, click on next, and download all records or download selected records and click on next. So that's how I will prepare one single FASTA file. Okay, however, a FASTA file, for me to then remember which ones were in which group is gonna be a little bit difficult. So instead of doing this, and here, I hope you guys understand the concept here, right? So out of all of the nucleotide sequences, we can now select specific types and we can download them and we will get a FASTA file just to kind of see what it looks like. Let's download it and see what's inside. I didn't see anybody's ideas in chat. So if you have any of those, um, you can post them. What exactly are you planning to, um, to analyze? In the meantime, I'll show you what the FASTA file looks like. So as we see here, there's a title, it's a complete genome. Here we have a sequence. And right after that, after the sequence, what you will see is the next sequence, right? So right here is the next sequence and the sequence will have a definition. What is the title of the sequence? So as I said, I emailed you as an example, a few FASTA files, MERS, SARS, coronavirus. You can look there. You can take those files in this next step that we will do, or you can use some of your own ideas that again, I haven't seen anyone write anything, but you can, um, you know, put in uh, whatever. Um, oh, I, I see that these links I was sending privately to make. Make sense. So just so that everybody has the links, these were the links that I posted. So everyone with me still? Okay. Okay, so, so there, Magdalas Mendoza, right? So that's a very good um, comparison, for example, pangolin versus humans. But tell me, were you able to find pangolin samples? Exactly, you couldn't find them. Okay, so how you can find them, I'll show you where, but not in that virus database. Another one came from canine versus human. Okay, were you able to find canine Integra? Okay. Um, yeah, I found them. Um, I found a sample in China. Okay. Great. How many? Just one. Um. I think so. The well, no, no, no. There's also one in South Korea. So I think I'm coming across two right now, but um, yeah. Okay, so keep searching. And, and the point is, right, so why am I asking you these questions? One, you might have a question, might be a good question, scientific question, you might just not have the data. Another option is you might have to go somewhere else to find the data. I'll show you a few other places where you can find more data. Or sometimes if you have just one or two samples with a lot of variation, think about this. If you have just two samples, one is from South Korea, one is from China, and you know this is all you have, and you want to compare it to 140 human genomes. Obviously, there's a lot of risk that you will have an unbalanced comparison. So that's why sometimes you got to look through all of the data that's available and kind of uh, you know, articulate a question that could be answered with data and could provide you with some more or less believable, reliable answers. Okay, great. So I, I'm glad to know that you guys are all 
doing this, continue looking for files, I'll show you the files that I shared with you. Okay, so here we have SARS. So let's take a look at how many do we have. A simple way to search for how many is to find this symbol. So it's one. So you can see it already tells us how many there are. There are five. So there are five SARS, five MERS, right? So you'll see that there's five of each. So we have a fairly balanced combination here of um, samples in each one. Now, the other thing that you will need is your reference genome. And the reference genome that I will use is the COVID-19. So this is the uh, accession number, MN909. So let's take a look at that one real quick on NCBI. And by the way, on NCBI itself, it doesn't always go directly to um, Go to NCBI. Doesn't always go directly to the virus database. It takes some time to be updated there. Um, so here we search for this and we want to find the genome. Or the nucleotide. Let's open it up and see what's inside. Okay. There we go. Okay, so this one, right, we see that it's the SARS coronavirus 2. That's the, the new one. It's got 29,900. And you can see that it is from China submitted on January 5th. Right? So that's the original one. So remember that if we want to have a reference genome, we can have a FASTA as a reference genome, or here you can see that this one is already organized with gene information in it. And that means that it will have information about the protein sequence also, not just the, um, the sequence of nucleotides. So if you want to have a reference genome, what you want to do is download it, complete record as a file, and download the GenBank information, right? So we'll have a uh, .gb at the end and not a FASTA. All right, so now let's go here. Instead of creating a demo, we will actually create a, 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 um, a real analysis. So we'll take some time. Don't expect this to come back right away. The more sequences you have, the longer sequences you have, the more time it will take. But if you start now, by the time we do another one of these workshops, you'll already have something to work with. So we can go to a virus quasi species. And the first thing that we need to do is select the file type. Again, you can use for this part of the session data that I gave you, or if you already had time to prepare the data, you can do that. So let's go, and here we'll use serotype FASTA, right? Because we don't have the FASTQ files, we have FASTA files. Here, we need to upload some of that data. So here, let's just compare, well, let's just compare COVID-19, um, MERS, and SARS. So they upload, right? You see I have them in different files. You can have them as a single file because if you will have them from, um, from uh, you know, the virus database export, you'll just have them as one. Okay, here, you could, if you have real time, for example, you have a sample that's from 2003, 
you have a sample from 2019, you can add those and the tree will be more aligned to those real dates. So we'll be able to translate evolutionary time into normal time. I don't have that right now. And here I have to have a reference genome. So here I will add the file and I will use that GenBank file as my reference. Um, Oh, sorry, that's for, that's for, uh, sorry, I was going to do, let me reset this again. Okay, FASTA, let's create this again. Go select FASTA, upload these files. Okay, so now we got to press on start. We'll just do a very simple pipeline today. So we'll do multiple sequence alignment like we did in the demo, then convert it to amino acid positions, and then we'll do codon. And then we can choose one of these. You can try all, but I'll just tr try one of them. So I'll do um, birth death process, and here I'll keep it at nucleotide level and end okay so this is mers sars novel corona virus 2 and birth death so again you can run exact same pipeline or you can run a different one and you can also do different types of combinations of files because obviously that's going to play a big role in the output that you will expect to see now the pipeline itself produces many different files one of them is going to be the phylogenetic tree as a pdf and that's going to be the best tree out of the possible ones that that method produced but we'll look at different ones once the pipeline is done it will also give you the actual multiple sequence alignment and so here there's an important part that's beyond the relationship right so let's say when i look at this tree and let me pull up this tree just so that we can take a look at some examples and talk about them okay so we did this so here's an example output between so this is actually what we saw on the sequence navigator where we saw um 44 different samples so this is a phylogenetic of those 44 samples what can we see in this tree we already looked at it we had a covid 19 sample that is most closely related to sars and less related to beta coronaviruses and even less to MERS, right? So how do we interpret these connections? Well, these connections show us that, you know, these most likely came from a much recent common ancestor than, for example, the novel coronavirus and beta coronavirus that are still in the same clade, if you look right here, right? Now you also have different methods that you can try here's the current samples that i provided you with the fasta files so here you can see that they were separated into different groups group one two three and four and those groups are by type so you can see sars covid19 mers beta coronavirus right so one thing that you want to understand from this is whether you're understanding of the relationships between these taxonomies actually come out in the sequence data right but beyond this it doesn't actually give you that much information you don't know where you don't know how so the next thing that we want to talk about today is where to look for once you have that multiple sequence alignment this is what multiple sequence alignment actually looks like so now 
the question is out of those 30,000 nucleotides, where do you actually look at? Okay, are there any questions up until now about um, what we did or what you want to do? I mean, you don't have to run a pipeline right now. You can take your time and run it later. But um, did you have any questions that you wanted to ask? Okay, as you come up with questions, you can put them in the chat. Well, it's better to trust them. So as we saw here, right, let's go back to what was explained, right? So this article, and you'll see a few more of similar articles coming out. One of the questions that came up was whether this virus was engineered in a biotechnology lab, whether it came from a bat, whether it came from a snake, whether it came from a pangolin. What exactly happened, right? Why is that important? Well, it's important because we need to prevent such things in the future, obviously. And we don't have right now an antiviral or a vaccine that really works well. And so we would like to understand, first of all, how to not repeat the same thing that happened, right? So if we know that this came from pangolins or snakes, we can just ban them, right? Uh, if we know that this came from a variety of different animals, that's a different story, right? We can't ban everything and monitor everything. So there's a different strategy for every one of these answers. And so one of the other concerns was whether this was an actual engineered virus. And the difference between engineered viruses and naturally occurring viruses is that they will not have only a single change that has a very specific phenotype. You gotta have some biological process that could occur naturally that can explain what, what happened, right? And so in this article, okay, so let me address some of these questions real quick. What did you choose for the outgroup for evolutionary time approximations? I didn't choose anything. What I mentioned was that if you have if you selected a specific sample, you can take two samples and say one is from 2003, one is from 2019. If your 2003 and 2019 are specific time points in the phylogenetic tree, then the distances in the phylogenetic tree could be associated with real years. Okay, so I didn't do anything, but if you find one, you can download two files is what you need, at least, and then you'll be able to add those. Um, okay, and Carrie was asking, what are the different beast modes? What do they compare? They compare different processes. So they compare, for example, birth death process. It's a process of a natural aging, birth, and death, right? So replication in this case is birth, and then the, the, um, that strain not being there anymore is the death, okay? So they're different. I will um, share some more information. I think it's also in the pop-ups, but those are just different beasts. Um, so in fact, just let me quickly share with you a publication on beasts um, so that you can take a look. So if you just search online, beast phylogenetics, phylogenetics. So you can see that it's Bayesian analysis of molecular sequences using MCMC, which is Monte Carlo uh, simulation. And it does um, incorporate some kind of a mathematical model um, that analyzes the sequences to determine a process, right? So some process that has a, a random probability of one stage happening from the next stage and the observed data helps us build a model that um, can explain this process. Okay, what other questions did we have? Okay, great question. So, um, okay. So again, we need to link this process identified by a model. A model will fit any process, right? But then we need to ask a biological question. Could this be explained by a bi biological process that we observe in nature? And so to 
talk about this, let's understand one of the key proteins in the virus, in all of coronaviruses, but it's a similar pattern that actually occurs in multiple different viruses, including HIV, including um, uh, flu, influenza. So this is not a protein, it's a tool. Protein is a tool, and it's not a unique tool to coronaviruses. Coronaviruses have a specific way this tool works for them. So let's see what's important because that will help explain some of these things right here, right? So right here you see receptor binding domain, polar basic cleavage site, receptor binding domain H2, right? And how, which residues are important to look at. It has these O-linked glycan residues, right? So we'll look at some of these concepts and what do they actually mean in terms of this protein. Okay, so the spike glycoprotein, this is the actual um, microscopy image of this virus. And you can see that it looks kind of like a circle and it's got these things poking out. And so when we talk about the spike glycoprotein, we're talking about this one right here. What does it look like? Well, imagine if it was in a perfect world, it would be perfectly round and all of these would be exactly the same, but it looks like this. This is an actual uh, electron uh, microscopy um, model that was published of the recent COVID-19, so novel coronavirus spike glycoprotein, but there's also ones available from SARS and from MERS and from others from before. So here you can see that it's basically consists of these three chains. Um, so these three chains, so this is the coding sequence for this gene is right here. This is the S glycoprotein, right around 21,000 uh, position on the nucleotide sequence. And you can see that it is a trimer. So that means it consists of three exactly similar components. So just to kind of quickly look at a um, visual here, if we go back to SeqNav, you can see it right here, surface glycoprotein. And if you click here, you'll be able to just twist it around and see what it looks like. So essentially it looks like a V. So th there's a V here, right? So let me turn it like this, um, not like this. So it's got this part, this part and a part that goes down and then it has this attachment. So this is in the open form. So this protein opens and closes. So we'll take a look at that in a second. What does it do? As you can see right here, attaches the virion to the cell membrane by interacting with host receptor, initiating the infection, binds to human ACE2 and these other receptors and internalization of the virus virus into the endosomes of the host cell induces conformational changes in the spike glycoprotein. Right, so let's see how this happens. The spike glycoprotein consists of two subunits, subunit one and subunit two, and they each have very important uh, structural components to them, including the signal peptide, the receptor binding domain, the fusion protein, heptad repeats one and two, transmembrane domain, and then the cytoplasm domain. So if you look at these two different subunits, so this is subunit one, this is subunit two, and these subunits, this one is on the outside and this one is on the inside. So essentially if you look at it from the top, it looks like this shape. This is the closed version. So it consists of three chains and they kind of form this uh, closed um, thing together. And you can see that underneath it's got this other part that looks like that. So if we spin it around, you can see that it's sort of like a cap, right? So it's a cap that sits on top of um, this other structure. This top, right, this full top has an internal section that's called the receptor binding domain. The receptor binding domain is what actually attaches to the, um, to the receptor. 
doesn't attach all at the same time, one of these three will attach the receptor. So the receptor is pretty small. Here you can see they compare this receptor between different coronaviruses. And you can see that the conserved part is that bottom part, the S2 subunit. The more variable is the top. Why is that? Well, obviously different cells types, different cell types, different hosts will have a different receptor structure. So to connect to different ones and to be able to adapt to the way different hosts function, it has to more uh, mutate this top part than the bottom part. The bottom part, we'll talk about its function in a little bit, has the same function everywhere. So this is this top receptor binding domain and the ACE2 protein. The ACE2 protein, as you can see, these um, both of these um, uh, PDB structures are available on the PDB uh, site. So you can see that you um, have a closed and then the open. And during the open, you see that one chain is open, connected to the receptor binding domain, or sorry, receptor binding domain connects right here to the ACE2 protein, right? This is it um, highlighted. Now the bottom subunit. So we talked about the top subunit. Now we have the bottom subunit. You can see that it's kind of like a stick. Again, it consists of these three different chains that are tied together. These chains are separated, right? So you can see that they're cleaved. There's a cleavage site, which means that once this top receptor binding domain uh, attaches to the uh, ACE receptor, there's a process and this whole top just falls off essentially. And now we have the functional part. So you can think about it as um, a robber um, having a gun in his coat, but once he enters the bank, the gun comes out and it puts the gun into someone's face, right? So before that it's hidden, it's, so it's really hiding it behind something. Once it knows we're close to the cell, we're close to the target, the, the top comes off and then the real tool comes out. So the cleavage site is right here. You can see this cleavage site um, uh, right there. And the cleavage site also is important because we also have a fusion protein. The fusion protein, so actually the, um, the bottom part has a very specific function, right? And that function actually, once that top part is taken off, the, the hat is taken off, this goes through a conformation process. So it transforms the shape. The shape of this whole protein changes and becomes flexible. It's like a cap that also keeps everything in place. And once it's off, this becomes a dynamic uh, structure. And the structure has a specific function, which only can work after this top part is cleaved off and the fusion protein becomes exposed. So how do we kind of see, so again, we talked about the top part, the key there is the cleavage site and the receptor binding domain. The bottom part has these important portions, the fusion protein, the cleavage site, um, sorry, this is repeated. Um, and then these are HR1 and HR2. So these are two important sites for the actual function of the bottom uh, subunit. How does it work? One moment, I gotta go see um, something happened with one of my kids. So give me just one moment, I'll be right back.
Okay, sorry about that. Um, okay, um, is everybody still here? Okay, <laughs> this is great. Um, so as you can see the process right here, right? So the, um, the receptor uh, binding domain right here, attaches to the ACE2 protein. Here it is attached. So this whole top comes off. Something happens. We don't exactly know how it goes from here to here, but it then goes up and you can see that these connect to the host cell and merge the virus with the host cell. And this is what it looks like when these are the H1, the heptad repeats. So these are H1 and H2 connected together. This is the fusion between them. And so it's those sequences of how this process works that are most interesting for us when we think about the biological process, right? So when we think about this biological process of adaptation to a different host, obviously the receptor binding domain is important. What else do you think is important to look for? Changes in which parts of this protein do you think are important from a standpoint of um, you know, different hosts, different immune systems? What else do you think is important? Fusion. Yes, exactly. So this process of fusion, I mean, imagine this. If this top part came off and nothing happened after that right so even right now as you know there's a a big effort to produce a vaccine um, and the way vaccines are typically done is they are training the immune system to recognize something right so what's the problem with that the problem with that so on one hand it's an opportunity because beyond the structural components, right? We talked a lot about amino acids. These are the N-linked glycans that are actually important for a lot of the ways that this protein works. So one, they're important for proper folding. So we see how folding and unfolding and folding into something else is very important, right? But also, modulating accessibility to host proteases and neutralizing at. So when we talk about immune system recognizing something, as you can see, the protein, the, the full virus, sorry, is hiding behind these poking out spike glycoproteins, right? So whenever the organism is looking out for something that's coming in, right? If it knew that there's a huge thing here, right, that contains a foreign RNA, it's going to sound all the alarms that it has, but it doesn't know because all it sees are the, the outside and the outside looks like small little pieces of something. So it's not a big deal. One. Number two, these uh, molecules prevent it from fully binding and, and feeling the shape of this whole protein. And the only thing that's actually exposed, as you can see right here, they're covering everything except for the receptor, receptor binding domain. But the receptor binding domain is closed together. So only when it opens up, it can be really felt. So when it opens up, right, that's when the immune system could recognize it, but only opens up when it's close to the cell membrane. And it only works next to cells that it infects, which are epithelial cells. So this process helps hide from the immune system from being recognized and drives this whole process of shaping. Now, a lot of people are focused on this receptor binding domain, but we'll see how this receptor binding domain actually has, right? And we talked about this last time, a lot of variation. So let's just look at conservation of these different areas between different comparisons that we were doing before, right? So here we're looking at MERS human versus COVID-19 human. We know that those two MERS and uh, novel coronavirus are pretty different, 
So this is expected. The red here is different. The white is similar. This is SARS versus human novel coronavirus 2. And so you can see that there's a lot less difference, right? A lot less red, but still a lot of red here on top. So the receptor binding domain is pretty different. This is the difference between the bad coronavirus rat G13 and the novel coronavirus 2, the human one. So you can see it's almost the same, except for some key points in the structures that we looked at, some of the cleavage, right? Some of the H, uh, the heptad repeat one, and some of the changes at the exact point of the receptor binding, right? Which is expected because obviously bat is different than human. So some of these changes also occur, right? So this is, we can look at the changes at the receptor binding domain with the H2. And you can see that co the novel coronavirus is actually almost identical in terms of the spike glycoprotein. However, it does have some variation right here where the yellow is, and that variation is not necessarily on the surface. So another thing that we're always concerned about when we are thinking about these vaccines is how broad spectrum is it going to be? How flexible is it going to be working with different viruses that we have now or that might emerge in the future, right? You know this problem from flu. Flu vaccine can have 6% effectiveness, can have 60% effectiveness, and that's a big difference. So if we go through the process of producing a vaccine, vaccinating people, it's got to work for something that's going to emerge that's going to look something like this, right? That coronavirus that is already different from previous ones that we knew, like for example, SARS, right? So if we produced a vaccine from SARS, would it be effective for this novel coronavirus? Maybe not. But then there are other strategies, right? And so the other strategies that are not related to the receptor binding domain could be related to that fusion process and the process of actually ent entry into the cell. And we'll see if we have more sessions like this, once we get the results from our analysis, we'll be able to look at the data that we get from the pipeline and understand how to find these important uh, positions on the genomic sequences, see specifically what the changes are, and identify how we can interpret those changes from the standpoint of this process of cell entry, and then, of course, replication, which is another um, big part of the problem, but not only, right? There's other uh, specific things that we have to understand um, about this whole process that causes such a heavy burden on um, infected patients. Okay, so I see that we um, covered a lot today and uh, we're running out of time. So are there any questions about um, what we did today? Okay, so let's quickly take a look at pangolins. Okay, so and you can see, by the way, don't just sit there with the uh, you know, page open and wait for it to finish. You gotta go back to my pipelines and you'll see your pipelines and just make sure that you're uh, monitoring this process. You'll also get an email notification once the pipeline is done. Um, and that might take a little bit of time depending on how many people and how many samples you have. Okay, so let's go to NCBI. Okay, so here, right, you can look at some of the things that are available right here. So you can see pangolin coronavirus, virome of dead pangolin individuals metagenome, right? So you remember how we looked at um, that paper from the bats where they originally uh, generated this rat G13 genome. 
So this is essentially what this is. So if you go here, you see that it has um, um, so we gotta go to that bio project. Go back. Um, for example, what is this? Let me come back. Um, probably search for Corona. So there's a FASTA file from Pangolin coronavirus. Genomic sequence. And again, this is, yeah, so you can see here that it's a full genomic sequence. If you go right here, send to file, and then here you can download the FASTA file. It was put on 20th of February. So, you know, I, I doubt you will find many of them. Um, I do want to tell you about another place where you can register if you're going to be interested in um, working on these kinds of uh, data sets. You can register on this GIS aid or maybe um, Sona can register and um, you guys can do this together. I don't know how strict they are on the registration. But you can see here a lot of this analysis, first of all, is done and constantly updated, but there's a lot more data here. Um, let me log in again. So you got, yeah, they, it takes, you know, um, a couple of days to get your password. But once you do, they have a lot more currently updated information um, coming from um, this pandemic. So, okay, so here, you can browse. See, there's a lot more. Um, see, same idea, right? You can just look for complete genomes. Um, here they have over 2,000 uh, from other places in Europe as well. Um, I'm not sure. So let's see. We have Tango in here. What was it saying? Yeah, I don't have any penguins ones, but I saw here canine. So I have just one from canine. So yeah, so you know, I think with Pangolin on NCBI, there's one. Uh, there are those raw files from Pangolin. And I think what would be an interesting thing to do is to analyze quasi-species of the different viral strains, um, which would be using FASTQ files, and you would use this section right here. Um, but also, you know, you can use that one sample, just like they did in this nature or in this nature communications. Um, where they compared, you know, just three bat genomes, one pangolin, and two humans, and that was a pretty good analysis. Any other questions? Okay, Sona, did you want to add anything to this? No, I think this was fantastic, Ilya. 
this is something new new for them and this is opens up uh, lots of different avenues that they can pursue on their own in terms of uh, you know comparing different things um i think this was fantastic so i i did everyone have a chance to submit your jobs uh, maybe it'll take a while right that uh, they can come back and look at the i don't know when you're going to have your next yeah. one to look at the results but uh, if you are going to have another one i'm not sure right so i i mean i started this one uh this morning and it's at 66 percent. so oh. you know depending yeah. on how many people we have in parallel uh another workshop that has quite a lot more people but not yeah. everyone has access to the platform so let's okay. see it should be over the weekend for oh, sure okay it says it completed for one student it completed okay. okay so there is a question for you for designing vaccines is rbd more antigenic would using rbd covalent with other structured domain be a good idea for designing vaccine due to the hinded or what is that word to rbd for most of the time okay so a very good question about um you know the receptor binding domain right i think before you ask how to design a vaccine you want to ask what in the receptor binding domain, the variation, the natural variation that occurs between different, today we looked at different species, right? Different hosts. But what about within the same, so all human, just COVID-19 patients, that would be a question to ask, right? Is there any variation there? And not only at the level of whole genomes being assembled, at individual like the virus quasi species right the sub strains that might happen at the same time in the same genome if we do another one of these uh, workshops i would love to talk a little bit more about other um, function of this virus and individual proteins even it's not just the viral replication that is um, causing a lot of the symptoms that we observe it's also the way that this protein works on its own and so it would be great to talk about that because I think there are some better candidates for vaccines, not just focused on the receptor binding domain. And I'm working with a few groups that you know are pursuing that route. So I, I think that they have a very valid point. But another thing to think about when we talk about these vaccines, it's important to see how vaccines um, can utilize um, multiple, multiple different proteins together and so once you have vaccines with multiple different proteins right another question is well how do you package this whole thing right maybe you need the whole um virion uh maybe with some variations that make it safe so we can talk about that i think there's a lot of good questions that are you know going to come up about vaccine design antiviral drugs uh, but it takes a lot more time to, you know, start thinking about those questions based on data, right? So let's, at this point, focus on doing some analysis that will give us good insight into the data. And once we have those results, we can start asking those questions with a more informed direction. So there's another question for you. HIV vaccines target CD4 receptor. Binding site from vaccine targets the interaction zone. Okay, so I'm not sure. Yeah, so I think that was more of a comment, right? So exactly, that was, you know, there are a lot of things to consider in vaccine design. It's not only that we train the immune system to recognize some pattern, it's also what that protein does on its own and what will the vaccine do on its own, right? Because when you put in some piece of protein inside the cell, it, it, it does something. Um, so there's a lot of things to consider for vaccine design. The smaller the vaccine, the less functional on its own, the better on one hand because it's safer, but whether it's as effective, right? That's another question. Hi, Elia. I'm sorry to unmute. I have just one comment for the vaccine because that's what we work on. And in some cases, actually some uh, interaction drive like uh, open structure. So some vaccine doesn't just target the binding site by, site by itself, but mainly in, 
like target the interaction zone. So it will be an antibody that will recognize the combined CD4, for example, GP120 for the HIV, but maybe it will be the same also in case of the corona. They will put like a common antibody that can recognize two parts, like the overlapping epitope. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That or even those, um, you know, HR1, HR2 uh, bound together. Um, yeah, those are good directions for vaccine design. Um, any other questions? Ilya, I don't know how to thank you. This was uh, fantastic. And um, I know that, uh, you know, uh, you've created this just for uh, my students and I greatly appreciate that. I know it's extra work on your part and I'm sure all of them uh, have learned a lot and I'm sure they all appreciate uh, quite a bit. And so <laughs> we'll be in touch uh, I'll be in touch with you. Uh, I know you're very busy right now, but then let me know, uh, give me some uh, time slots that we can talk to see how we can uh, format this into other things, so. Okay, sounds great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you and let everyone. us know once the recording is available. I will. Yeah. Thank All you so right. much, Ilya. You take care. Thank you.